Thank you, everybody. Hey, my name is Ivo Jensen. I'm a solution architect here at AWS in the nonprofit team. Uh, and today we're going to talk about adopting serverless patterns in your cloud migration. Um, so what I've seen in, in my role as a solution architect that a lot of uh, uh, organizations moving to the cloud, they often start with doing then with a, with a lift and shift approach. So what lift and shift is, as you probably know this, is a bit of staking your existing VMs um, from your on-prem data center and just migrating them to either EC2 or maybe like a VMware on AWS, right? And while that's a great first step, I think you're leaving a lot on the table in terms of cost optimization and efficiencies. Um, and so I was wondering why that is, right? And I think uh, me working in a nonprofit space, I work with like a, a nonprofit research facility uh, uh, organizations, work with charities, and these organizations are really good at executing on their mission, but maybe not so good uh, on understanding cloud IT strategies, right? It's just not a core competency that they have. So what I want to talk about today is a little bit how we can break that cycle, give some examples on how you can go serverless, how do these patterns look like, and, um, and drive that adoption that way. So let's start a little bit about what these um, organizations think uh, of when they think about uh, cloud migration. So we did a survey around 700 nonprofits on uh, uh, what are your top reasons for using to the cloud. And of course, top reason is getting out of your on-prem data center footprints. That's, that's typical. But we're also looking at uh, um, less worrying about maintaining servers and licenses uh, and being more agile, expanding resources when you need them, right? So doing that elasticity. And at the same time, there's some concerns around there as well, some concerns around cost and security. Right, so all those items that we hear, hear there are, are ripe for serverless adoption, but we still don't see that uh, at the rate of adoption that we would like to see. So let's take a step back and let's look a little bit about the different types of cloud migrations that we can have. And at Amazon, at AWS, we look at that in, in terms of the seven R's. Right, so uh, uh, lift and shift is on there as rehost. Um, we have replatform, which is basically kind of like a lift and shift, but uh, moving a little bit to managed services. But what I want to focus on today really is that re-architect type of migration into the cloud, where we focus on, on re-spinning your application to be built cloud native in a serverless way. So what are some of these patterns? Replatform is a good start if you want to go past a lift and shift. So what replatform is, is, is think about like if you have a, a SQL server on your um, uh, on your on-prem server, you're going to run that on RDS. So at least you don't have to worry about managing the underlying EC2 instance. If you have a container workload running and you bring that into the cloud, then um, you can run it on our serverless uh, compute platform, Fargate, right? So you don't have to worry about managing these EC2 instances. So that's a great first step. But I really want to go and get a, a piece further there with re-architecting and, and re-architecting the application to take full benefits of what cloud is really good at. And if you're building new, by the way, definitely start with a serverless approach first uh, to, to think about your workload. So this is more like a traditional architecture. I'm sure you've drawn architecture diagrams like this before. I drew this one a long time ago. I wouldn't even say, don't even take a picture of this one because I don't want to talk about this one. <laughs> because uh, think about what are the drawbacks of this architecture, right? Let's talk about cost. This never actually scales to zero. You might want to, if there's no uh, um, uh, incoming requests through your load balancer, you're still having a base footprint around your database. You probably have at least one EC2 instance running in each of your AZs. So it never really scales to zero. Uh, security, you have to manually think about uh, uh, putting, the, uh, putting the components in the right subnet with the right security, maintaining SSL libraries, all that kind of stuff, right? And those sort of management overhead is, is, is quite large. So we want to move away from this and, and move up the stack and do less in terms of management and security and less worrying for you so you can focus really on your workload. So what really, serverless really is, is moving up the stack and handing off more and more components about your, uh, uh, more and more uh, properties around management security off to us, to AWS, so you don't have to focus it anymore. If you look at the, the stack on the right, the physical infrastructure starts there, right? So when you go to the cloud, even on EC2, there will be um, uh, 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 physical infrastructure will be handled for you. But as you go up the stack and go more serverless, we will take care of more and more of, of, of components for you. And so the way that works 
is, uh, uh, Warner calls it small pieces loosely joined, right? So you take all these individual components, serverless compute with Lambda, serverless storage with S3, serverless orchestration with step function, you put those together uh, um, and in, in, a, in, a, in a system with event management and queues and, and, and messages. And the way that you uh, trigger this flow is either to an external API, for instance, an API gateway where incoming HTTP requests can be routed, or maybe some kind of other event-driven architecture like uh, you drop a file in an S3 bucket and that kicks off some kind of workflow. And so maybe good to understand here is it's, it's more than just compute. Serverless compute is, is what you maybe think of, but there's way more than that. So yes, we have Lambda for serverless compute, uh, a Fargate for serverless uh, uh, container operations. Uh, you probably know S3 and DynamoDB, but uh, I'm not sure if you've seen uh, the keynote on Monday night from Peter DeSantis, but he went in a lot of detail about some new innovations we've done with Dynamo, D uh, with, uh, sorry, with Aurora Serverless, right? So our Postgres MySQL layer, but now serverless. So that's a great, a great example of how we kept innovating there. So data stores, databases, storage, <coughs> And then put all that stuff together as well with, uh, uh, with orchestration, with message passing, like, like SQS, SNS, and orchestration with step functions. So a great advantage here is that as you move up the stack to the right, again, you can hand off more and more uh, 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 parts of that workload to us so we can manage them for you in terms of management, in terms of security. And we, do, we call it the shared security and the shared responsibility model, right? So all the way on the left, uh, in your on-prem data center, you're literally physically wrecking and stacking hardware. As you move towards the cloud, uh, in EC2, we take care of the physical layer for you. But if you go all the way to the right, what you'll see is that you think less and less about the underlying infrastructure and how it's managed and secured, and more and more about your workloads. Like if you play with Lambda, you don't, you don't think about how many instances uh, did Amazon spin up to power my Lambda function, right? If you use S3, uh, you don't think, is this, how is this data sharded? How did it distribute it? You just take the SLA that we provide, about 11 nines of durability, and you go with it. And if you want security, just check the mark and that's it, right? So easy peasy. And that allows you to focus on your workload. And we've been doing this uh, for a long, long time. Uh, uh, L Lambda went GA in 2015, and ever since we've been innovating continuously on this through, uh, through Fargate uh, innovations with, with orchestrations and step functions, uh, and then serverless solutions like S3, uh, and now Aurora Serverless. So all, innovating all the way to literally this week when we announced new innovations uh, and great features in Aurora Serverless, where you can now run your databases, MySQL and Postgres, uh, in a serverless way without even having to think about, about, about instances, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the promise of, um, of serverless. This is a great quote uh, uh, from our CTO, Werner Vogels, to show you how, how visionary he was. In 2016, containers were state of the art, so he was at London Summit, and he had a talk about containers, and he said, well, actually, containers are great now, but in a serverless world, you don't have to think about, well, containers anymore, you know, so we've been innovating ever since. So, what are the kind of things you build? Like I said, uh, I'm a nonprofit SA, so I focus a lot on the nonprofit. So whenever you see nonprofit in the slides, uh, that, that's because that's my background, but sure, it applies to all industries, right? So often what we see, these adoption cycles, they start with some IT automation, little lambdas to get little configurations going, little, little workflows, right? And then once, once the, the teams get a little bit more understanding on how it can work, uh, often the next step is, is data, data streaming. So if you think about it, when you work with large sets of data, you don't really want to worry about, is my instance large enough to hold the data? What about the queuing of the data? Did I attach enough ENI network bandwidth to my instance to manage this, right? So you don't want to manage any of these things. You want to, um, you want to hand this off to us and use serverless, uh, opportunity, serverless applications like Kinesis, for instance. Web applications, maybe that's the most straightforward, at least to me, thought about how you build serverless solutions. And we'll have some examples on there on some, some use cases that I've seen in the field in my industry. Um, so we'll dive a little bit more into that. And then also machine learning. So if you think about machine learning, if you've played with SageMaker, if you, if you do SageMaker, you're still really spinning up instances, right, traditionally. So you, you train a model or you do some inference, you build an endpoint, and you go like, okay, I need 
four of the uh, you know, G4DN instances, or I need like three of the, the G4 instances for my instance. So you're still talking about instances that you then have to pick an AMI for to actually run on those. But if you think about Bedrock, Bedrock is completely serverless, right? You pay as you go, you don't pay for the instances, but you just pay per, per, per prompt, per token, basically per API call. So I'm going to go a little bit more into detail in a, in a use case that I've seen over and over in the industry and dive a little bit deeper on what that architecture looks like. And that's a document upload and processing use case. And, and I'll tell you what prompted me to actually submit this talk here. It's because I saw this over and over. For instance, I worked uh, with a food charity. And this food charity uh, basically had a distribution network. And they got orders from the distributors for, for, you know, to, to request food for, to be distributed. And so I worked with them, and instead of building a traditional way of just spinning up some Java code on EC2, we go like, what if you just, if your distributors d drop that order into a portal and then go to S3 and we kick off some kind of serverless workflow? Similarly, I worked with a disaster relief company. This disaster relief company, when a, when a disaster strikes, a hurricane, a flooding, they have volunteers that go on out in the field and take pictures of all the damage. So this is another great use case for serverless, where all these volunteers upload these pictures that then kick off some kind of workflow to, um, uh, uh, to basically assess the damage in each of these pictures with machine learning, and then build these heat maps to figure out where we should respond first. So those were the two cases that I built a stock on, and to validate that I was on the right path, like earlier this week, true story, I was at the ex asked the expert booth here in the expo hall. A lady came up to me, and she had an idea. She had this use case about uploading uh, um, Excel sheets that she needed to process, uh, and she did, she was wondering how to get started. And she, we actually came came down to using a, a again this exact same pipeline that I'm going to show you here, right? So let me let me walk you through this and see how easy it is to build this. Forget this. Again, I'm going to skip through this, right? So I'm going to make it much simpler. Right? So we're starting with uploading uh, um, an object, an Excel sheet, an order, an image to an S3 bucket. So S3 has this concept of a trigger, uh, an S3 trigger that can invoke some kind of workflow, like a Lambda function. So we invoke the Lambda function. And then that Lambda function can do different things. And this is a really common pattern that we see, and it can do all kinds of things. It can kick off uh, this order into an order distribution system. Uh, it can kick off uh, a machine learning workflow, right? So for the use case that I worked with the, uh, the disaster relief agency on, is we custom trained the SageMaker model, uh, build an endpoint, and every time uh, an image was uploaded, we would do some geocoding. Uh, for, for the location of that image on, on the EXIF data, and, and then do some assessment on the custom trade damage model. And that really reduced the time for them uh, to, to manually scan these pictures from, from, like days to, from like days to literally hours. Right? And then other things like storing that data in, 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 a, in a system of record like a DynamoDB. Right? So this is the basic flow. And then the next step, you want to make productize this and, 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 and make this uh, into a um, robust uh, um, um, a product, uh, a production level system, right? So um, step functions is a great way to do that. Step functions allows you to, to, to hand off the error handling, the retrying um, uh, to Amazon again, so you don't have to worry about that. So, and this scales great. So uh, the use case that we had with, with this uh, uh, image uh, damage assessment application is like there's often no workload right in the winter there's no hurricanes so the, the load was literally zero and the great thing is you pay zero right if the cost is zero um, and then if it needs to scale up if there's a, an emergency you never know when that strikes so we have to scale up immediately uh, and step functions definitely does that for you so uh, uh, we can easily scale up from zero to tens of thousands or uh, millions of, of triggers with parallel executions in, in step functions is fine. So great use case, reproducible for so many of these same workloads. So I hope what I can trigger here with you, uh, no pun intended, is, is to figure out how you can fit your use case into this really, really simple pattern of literally a step function with a few lambdas and, and, and hand off all the security and all the management to us. So what does it give you? It gives you only pay for what you use. And this, it's a funny phrase. Uh, again, in the Monday night keynote with Peter DeSantis, what he said is, uh, he has a great, uh, he has a great like 
thing about serverless. So go watch that keynote if you haven't seen it yet. But he said, with EC2, or with, with, with instances and with EC2, you pay for what you provision. Not pay for what you use, pay for what you provision, which is still better than in a data center, right? In data center, you provision for your peak demand. And with EC2, you can auto scale, and you can provision for your elastic demand. However, you still pay for these instances, right? Like the, the, the original uh, thing that I threw up there, it's um, you still pay for at least three instances and three AZs and some kind of small instance database that you then have to manually scale to a larger instance, right? With serverless, you literally pay for what you use. That system uh, um, for the disaster relief agency is, is, is idle for most of the year, but exists and costs them, in terms of compute at least, literally zero. There's still some storage cost, uh, obviously. Availability and security is built in to all these options. Um, you, don't, you don't worry about availability of, of Lambda or whether it can scale, right? You know it can scale. S3, you don't go like, okay, whatever, I have more objects, do I have to expand my storage? Don't think of that with serverless. And then redu reduce maintenance, no infrastructure provisioning there. So a, a, a great opportunity to lower your TCO by adopting these serverless patterns um, in, in a lot of ways. So what does it mean for you for business benefits? Uh, um, better agility by having to be allowing you to focus on just your business logic and your API so you can easily spin up new projects much faster than you were able to previously with the performance that you need, with the low cost profile that you discussed, and, and the security is built in. Give you one more use case here, a data use case. This is from Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, what I wanted to do is, is basically go a little bit at scale and, and, and uh, work on pediatric cancer. So what I wanted to do was run basically every single data point of, of, uh, uh, that they had on pediatric cancer patients uh, through a pipeline. And so that was a lot of data that they went to run in for, uh, one time. They, they did that with some of our uh, uh, serverless data options like Kinesis. Just so, again, step functions was in there to orchestrate all of this and then use some of our data functionality uh, to run that through. What's a good time to start? The answer is always yesterday, right? But what's really a good time to start? Uh, let's look at when you're doing your initial cloud migrations. If you can, instead of doing a lift and shift, uh, in that process, try to figure out some workloads you can modernize as you're migrating, you're ahead of the curve. We understand that's not always possible, so that lift and shift first is great. You can do that, uh, but maybe think about refactoring them as you go. So do a lift and shift first or refactor later is definitely a wonderful cloud migration strategy. And if you're building that new software, definitely think about this methodology first, right? Talking about uh, 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 um, doing it yesterday, right? Andy Jesse has a quote that says, if Amazon.com, right? So you're talking about if Amazon.com had to start over today, it will be built serverless. When Amazon started in 1996, serverless was not a thing, so it wasn't built that way, but that refactoring takes place every day um, in our service teams. Kind of brings us to a conclusion of, of this talk. Uh, if you want to learn more, we have a great website, serverlessland.com. It's maintained by AWS, by our serverless uh, expert community within AWS. So please check that out. We have examples, reference architectures, uh, some great links to talks for reInvent23 right here. Uh, so please check that out um, uh, afterwards. And with that, same slide. I'm going to thank you. Please uh, fill out the survey in the app. We uh, would appreciate the feedback to get, get the quality of these talks up. So please do fill out the survey. And with that, I want to say thank you and enjoy the rest of your reInvent.